This podcast is brought to you by Onnit. Go to Onnit.com and look at the great selection of supplements. If you find something you like, press in code Joey and get 10% off delivered right to your house. What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? It's Monday, the 12th of December. The joint is brought to you by Manscaped. Listen, tis the season to shave your nutsack. Manscaped is the one-stop shop for all your holiday needs. Right now, the lower, the Lone Mower 4.0 will help you trim your tree and shave you all the way down to the fucking trunk of death. Manscaped is here to make the holidays shopping a blast. If you got a grandfather, an uncle, a fucking dad, a brother who's half a fucking mook, Manscaped is what he needs. He needs a piece of ass and Manscaped. So right now, get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com slash Joey, J-O-E-Y. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com slash Joey. Manscaped, get your jingle balls ready for the motherfucking holidays. The joint is also brought to you by Blue Chew. Since you're cleaning your fucking dick, I'm going to give you some pills to fuel, the, to fuel that stick of death. The temperature is dropping, but you meet the thermometer is staying hot thanks to Blue Chew. Blue Chew is an online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets, all at a fraction of the cost. Take them anytime and be ready whenever an opportunity arises. I love Blue Chew. You can take it on the go, empty stomach, full stomach. You're ready to sling dick within minutes. And the process is simple. You sign up at BlueChew.com. You consult one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you receive your prescriptions within days. The best part is it's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting online at the pharmacy. Blue Chew tablets are made in the U.S. of A. and shipped in a discreet package. Nobody knows nothing. You understand me? If you could fucking benefit from extra confidence when it's time to sling dick, Blue Chew can help. <coughs> Try Blue Chew for free. That's right. It's Monday. Free day. Using promo code Joey. Just pay $5 for shipping. That's it. Five dollars for shipping. I'm gonna give you a month supply for free. That's bluechew.com with code Joey for your first month free for December. So you can sling dick. And when Santa comes in, show me a little pink helmet. He'll fucking leave you an extra cookie. Visit bluechew.com for more important safety information. I want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the joint. Now, without further ado, let's get this motherfucker started, Jack. What up, you bad motherfuckers? Monday, the 12th of motherfucking December. What do you got, 12 shoplifting days left to fucking Christmas? You better get to it, chop, chop. There ain't a lot of shit left on the fucking shelves either. It was a great weekend. I'm looking forward to another fucking great week, especially here on the joint. Before we get started, I got to tell you about a little fucking uh, story that happened this weekend. Saturday, my daughter had a game, whatever the fuck, and... Uh, I get there, and the dads are there, and the moms are there, and we're all talking, you know. And as I'm walking out, one of the dads says to me, hey, Joey, I got something for you. He goes, I picked this up in the city the other day. Take a bite. And I look at it. It's mushroom chocolate, 100 milligrams of THC with mushrooms in it, right? He goes, thank you for the gummies. He goes, uh, I want to, you know, pay you back, whatever. Okay. So he goes, uh, how many do you want? I go, just give me like, what's it say? He goes, one is the same thing as the Silly's mushrooms, except this is chocolate. It says like the, the back, the box set, like one for clarity, <laughs> like three to four if you want some movement and like eat the whole bar if you just want to fucking. So he goes, do you want a piece? I go, give me half the fucking bar. You know, it's a hundred more. <laughs> give me half the fucking bar. So I do that. I come home and... Uh, I eat some other edibles that I got from, uh, not the true dose stuff ones, but the heavy duty ones from uh, whatever the fuck, Stoner Club, right? 
And it's like the cherry ones, fucking stronger than shit. The whole bag's 500 milligrams. I just ate the whole thing. It's Saturday night. The UFC's on. I got shit going on at 6 o'clock. I forget all about the mushrooms, the whole fucking thing. I run some errands. I run over to my buddy's house. We eat some dinner. I come back home. My wife, my daughter home. It's got to be 930, you know. I'm high. Like, I can feel the fucking, uh, the THC. The mushrooms hadn't kicked in yet. I didn't know if they had kicked in with all the shit I took last night. I didn't know if they were going to kick in. So my wife and I are watching something on TV. And all of a sudden she says, I'm starting to get tired. I'm not going to finish this with you. Whatever this. We'll watch it again tomorrow. Night. Whatever. And I go, okay. So I'm thinking, you know, it's 10 o'clock. I'm going to probably go upstairs. And I'm pretty fucking high. But all of a sudden my daughter runs down. And she's like, Dad, can we put on the Adams Family? And I'm like, sure. Why not? I'm not doing anything. You know, we, we usually watch the honeymooners on, on at midnight. So I thought she was going to, I don't know. I, I don't know what I was thinking. But all of a sudden, she's watching the fucking Adams Family. And at this time, like now, my eyes are starting to get like fucking, you know, like I'm going like this. I'm not seeing streaks. It's like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Maybe triple vision, double vision. I don't fucking know. So I'm like, I got to like squint and shit to watch the TV. And I feel the mushrooms starting to hit me now. Like I'm giggling at the Adams Family, right? I'm giggling. It's the old show. And my daughter's, it's the movie, right? With uh, with uh, the Puerto Rican dude as uh, whatever and uh, Angelica Houston as the fucking mom, whatever the fuck. So there's a scene, man. I'm just sitting there, I'm getting my, and I could see that Mercy's kind of looking at me like, Dad, you're giggling a little too much tonight. You know, what, <laughs> what's going on with you? Something's not right. And I fucking, uh, there's a scene where Lurch gets out of the car. I don't know who's playing Lurch, guys. But Christina Ritchie's whatever Wednesday and the other fucking Pugsley, and the, Lurch gets out of the car, and the little girl goes, drink this, Lurch, or some shit. Now the mushrooms are starting to hit me. I'm getting into the movie, right? And next thing you know, she gives the drink to Lurch. Lurch is like, okay. And he fucking drinks it, and it's like some pepper. It's got some fire in it and shit. And all of a sudden, Lurch just goes, it just hits him. <laughs> this thing just hits him. And then he just goes, and it's just pure fire. It comes out of his mouth. I'm like, what the fuck? But there's an Indian, an Indian, like an Indian, a statue of an Indian or an Indian standing there and when he blows the fucking fire it just destroyed the, the indian goes on fire i mean they're gonna have to cut that scene out of the movie that's definitely it. i'm losing it because it's politically correct it's years ago it's an old movie i mean raul Julia has been dead for fucking 20 years i think the guy who who played whatever and uh dog i just lost it it was like being eight in the eighth grade it was like being a fucking kid at a goddamn Pink Panther movie in Jersey City, New Jersey. I fucking lost it. There was like two other scenes that they did that I lost it. Then the mushrooms kind of got overpowered by the THC. <laughs> Thank fucking God. But when Lurch blew that fire out of his mouth, <clears throat> and that Indian just burnt to death. And then they show the Indian just go, Shh, and the fire disappears. I think the mushroom tapped into it. It's really interesting what they're doing with these mushrooms, even the sillies. It's like a little buzz. It's an enjoyable fucking buzz. You're not in deep. The whole time on those mushrooms, the whole time I've been eating these sillies, I've had one accident. One night I went over to the city, and I think I ate, I lost count. I ate like three on stage, two when I got off, five more on the drive. And when I walked in that door, I was high and fuck. And again, it was a Saturday night and my daughter was up. And I had to sit with her with those fucking things just on fire. And she's asking me questions. But if you got a chance to watch The Addams Family, I was fucking dying. I had, you know, guys, what? it's not like I go to the fucking video store and I'm like I want the Adams Family but the Adams Family is blowing the fuck up lately with this Wednesday show this Wednesday show I saw something that they've gotten more hits on this Wednesday show than anything yeah. like anything strange times strange days strange fucking stranger things I never seen that either but it just destroy it it's so weird how they're doing like these movies I'm doing little shows now 40 years later look at the Karate Kid 40 years fucking later, and you got another franchise network, you know, Sick Cobra Kai, and they're selling T-shirts. I went down to 
somewhere the other day and they had a Cobra Kai Lego or something, one of those fucking things. I'm like, Jesus Christ, that a Cobra Kai book at Barnes and Noble about a month ago. <clears throat> and now, you know, this is a series that's, fuck, I grew up on that series when it was in black and white with the original Festa. And now, you know, you got Wednesday. It's it's just fucking amazing what they're doing with old ideas, guys. I do a fucking movie of the week, and, and it's crazy on Patreon. It's crazy what, you know, because I have to look into the movies and read a little bit about them and think about them. Sometimes the movie's on, I've forgotten about. But it's not like all the movies that I fucking like I would give out as a, a movie of the week. But you see how... All those great, I give a lot of movies out from the 70s, guys. And I don't want to sound like that fucking dude. I don't want to sound like Quentin Tarantino or Scorsese. You know, for me, those were, you got something out of those movies. You left those movies going, what the fuck did I just watch? Whether it was The Exorcist, the original Longest Yard. You know, now I go to a movie and I leave and I forgot I even went to the fucking movies. I went to one movie I remember this year, Wakanda Forever. That That's it, you know, because... And the other reason why I remember it is the Mexican dude from Narcos is in that motherfucker. And he's got little boots that make him fly around. So the whole movie, I kept telling my daughter, hey, I told you fairies wear boots. No, they don't, Dad. No, they don't. It's fucking amazing, guys, what they're doing. I got to tell you something else. When I was watching that fucking movie Saturday night, I was watching Raul Julia. And for you motherfuckers that don't know, I'm going to tell you something. They talk about all these great actors and people who could fucking... Let me tell you something. Raul Julia was a fucking savage. And if you don't believe me, just the range he had to do like a kid's movie like Adam's Family. This motherfucker did a movie called Tequila Sunrise. Shit with fucking Mel Gibson and Kurt Russell about a drug dealer. He's tremendous in that. If you've never seen Kiss of the Spider Woman, holy shit is Raul Julia fucking great in that movie. Raul Julia is a Puerto Rican fucking savage. The funniest thing ever, there was a kid in L.A. that was running around telling people he's Raul Julia's son. I swear to God, this guy for fucking years. And the people were like, really? You're Raul Julia? He's a great actor. He would cry. And then it came out that fucking, that guy wasn't even Raul Julia's DNA. I think Raul Julia's wife made him take a DNA and there was no DNA. And it came out and he was like the laughing stock of Hollywood. Who the fuck knows anymore with these people? Welcome to Hollywood, cocksuckers. I got this interesting fucking email the other day. Guy on Patreon was talking to me about uh every once in a while, man, listen, you get a lot of stupid shit from people, you get interesting stuff from people. A motherfucker, Jake Cattell, sent me the fucking article of when I robbed the jewelry stores in Snowmass. He found them. Not the original Snowmass Time one, but the Snowmass Sun which got released on Sundays. And it says more burglarized on Christmas Eve. I get great shit. You know, he hunted it down. This is the second time, a third time he's helped me out, Jake, with this type of shit. But uh I get some great emails. I get people who just send me like questions. Uh, what's your favorite band? What are you smoking tomorrow? You know, whatever. <laughs> but you get some people that really like uh, hit you home and you're like, wow, that email threw me for a fucking loop. And he said that in this email that uh, I never like to give out names because yeah, that's not my bag. Somebody said to me, why don't you, you talk to people on the phone? Because I don't want people to hear other people's fucking problems. I like to bring up a problem to discuss how I would handle it. This isn't even a problem. It's just something that people need to know, especially this time of the year when people are thinking of changing shit up. You know, people are like, you know what? I'm thinking of quitting drinking for a while or maybe I'm going to give pot a break December 31st or maybe I'm going to stop with the pills or the Coke, whatever the fuck your poison is, you know? And it's so weird. I have a friend now who's... Uh, he lives in California. He's a big dude, and he got diagnosed with something. And he called me. We were talking about three weeks ago. He was telling me how he's going for the surgery. He gained a lot of weight all of a sudden. But in all my conversations with him, like, he has to do a little workout. I guess the surgery is, like, in January. And he's been trying to work for I got a couple friends that are doing the surgery next year. But this guy is a big guy that just got hurt and he never could work out again whatever the fuck the story is but we've been talking he 
it's really weird how these two stories connect. He always talks to me about when he has the surgery, how his life is going to change. And I'm happy for him. I'm his brother. I'm here for whatever the fuck he needs. But it's like your life isn't going to change that much unless you change it. You know, when you're talking about losing weight, it's a lifestyle change. When you're talking about not drinking no more, it's a lifestyle change. When you're talking about not doing drugs, it's a lifestyle change. When you're talking about losing weight, it's a lifestyle change. They're all lifestyle changes. You're just not quitting something. You're just not walking away from something. Your whole lifestyle has to change. You know, when when I got on Weight Watchers, yes, I thought it was a fucking diet. But no, it's not you're just going to eat fruit today and then tomorrow you're going to go and eat two gallons of Ben & Jerry's, even though I love fucking Ben & Jerry's. New York Super Fudge Chunk, when you're a stoner, there's nothing better than Ben & Jerry's at night. But, you know, you when I went to... Uh, White uh, White Castle. When I went to fucking the Weight Watchers, I didn't know what to expect, you know. And as I went to more meetings and I got involved, I learned. You know, they tell you to go to the meetings because it makes things easier. And I found Honest Engine that when I was going to meetings, I was losing more weight, right? I was losing more weight, right? So, it was a lifestyle. I realized that I had to incorporate a gym with it. I realized that I had to drink fucking water. I realized that to lose weight, you got to sleep. Sleep is important. So it's a fucking lifestyle change. It's not just that you just stop eating. Well, I'm just going to stop smoking pot. I'm, I'm going to stop drinking. But what are you going to do now? What are you going to hang out at the bar? No, you got to change your fucking lifestyle. You can't see those people no more. That dude with the fucking that does three martinis and an onion for lunch. You can't be hanging out with him no more. You're trying to change your life. I know you love the guy. You know, you love the motherfucker, but you have to keep it calm for a few weeks. So it becomes a lifestyle change. The question this guy dumped on me was, which was fucking brilliant. He goes, hey, he stopped eating Oxycontins. Like he was on Oxycontin for like eight years and alcohol and blow, but his main poison was Oxycontins. He went to a rehab. The dude's intelligent as fuck. He's an engineer. I mean, I'm not dealing with like a street level guy here. You know, he's been on uh, Patreon for about a year. So he said he went to a rehab, went to a sober living facility. It was a lot easier than what he anticipated because they always scare the fuck out of you when you try to quit anything. You know, oh, it's going to be so rough. You're going to puke. Your dick's not going to get hard. You know, he said that he adjusted to that shit easy, a lot easier than uh, what he expected, you know. But he said that he's sober six months and that he just can't get it together. Like people still treat him weird and, you know, he has no confidence, and the guy's got two kids. I mean, uh, he has a good job, but you could see he's lost. And, and I tell him, listen, keep hitting me up. You know, like, we've been talking about his sobriety for a few months now, but just this question baffled me. And, I, you know, sometimes when you ever get, like, somebody ask you a question, and, you, and they put you in a spot, like, you got to fucking answer them. That's not fair sometimes. Let me think about it. Give me a fucking day to think about what, you know, that's the only way I can answer it, uh, I don't know, the best of my ability, you know. There's some quite, hey, when are you going to, when are you going to jerk off Tuesday morning? You know, that that's easy to say, but when are you going to do this? I fucking have no idea, you know. There's questions that you need time. So he goes, you know, it was, it's just been so weird how quitting was so easy, but adjusting has been a motherfucker. He goes, if I would have known, I would have kept eating the fucking pills. And I'm like, no. You're doing the right thing. So I, you know, I just, I didn't even answer him. I waited for a few days. I got high. I went for a ride. I went to the gym, you know. And I thought about the fucking quiet. You know, something happened to me Monday this week. It was great news. I got great news about something. I didn't even process it till like Friday. I wasn't happy about it till like Friday morning. That's the type of guy I am. Like it takes me a couple of days to, to that's a great question, you know. And I was thinking about when I got sober. When I got sober, uh, I got sober like mid-November. I got I was in a movie, 
So I didn't, for, for 30, for 20 something days in a row, I, I was involved in this movie. There was no really going out at night. And the other time I was down, I would just stay home and hide. I was just staying home and hiding because I didn't want to do coke. I didn't want to see anybody who would make me think about coke. And I really wanted to quit. And after about, it was like, I think that December, and I never said nothing to nobody. When I quit cocaine, I didn't say shit to nobody because, dog, you know how it is when people say, yeah, I've been clean for 30 days. You're like, give this fucking guy another week. I'm still not going to leave my wallet in your, you know, <laughs> just because you've been sober for 30 days doesn't mean I'm going to leave my wallet in front of you. You know, and guys, I'm not being judgmental, but this is just the way it is, guys, you know. <clears throat> so I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to be that dude. You ever see that dude disappears for 60 days and all of a sudden you see him and he's drinking water and he's got like a headband on. He's like, I just left the gym. I feel great. I haven't done a drug in 64 days. And you're like, you fucking mutt. You know, there he is trying to make everybody feel bad. Like I'm working out now. I bench 400 pounds. You know, shut the fuck up. And then a year later you see him and you're like, what happened to the gym? Oh, you know, whatever the fuck. So I didn't want to say anything. I didn't say anything till fucking maybe February. But I'll never forget that January, working at Cobb's Comedy Club with Rogan, Tate, Brian, Ari, Duncan. We were all up there. And I think I told Ari first. I go, Ari, I'm not, I haven't done blowing two fucking months. Because it was two months when we went up to Cobb's. And he was like, come on. I'm like, yeah, I haven't said nothing to nobody. I haven't done anything, you know, don't say nothing. I don't want Rogan to know. I don't want anybody to know. I want to be sober at least a year before I raise my hand, before I'm a jerk off, you know. And uh, that was great. All that shit was great. I could see my stand-up was trying, starting to get a little better, but I wasn't healed. It took a while to get fucking healed. But what happened was when I was doing powder and all that shit, and I don't know if I told Mike this, but I always used to tell Lee. I used to go, listen, man, my biggest problem when I was doing coke wasn't the fucking coke or the money or sleeping or getting to the job or whatever. My toughest job, well, I shouldn't say getting to the job. My, my, The toughest problem I had was you counting on me. Like you could never count on me for anything. If I told you eight in the morning... You know, odds were not in your fucking favor. You know, and it's sad. It, it's 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 very fucking sad when you can't make plans with somebody. Like the last three years of my addiction, guys, there's people still waiting for me at the airport. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I was going to Houston and I would call. They go, are you at the airport? I'm at the airport. I'm about to get on the plane. I wasn't even at the fucking airport. I hadn't even showered yet. I was still in my living room doing blow from the night before. And I would call the club owner and go, just pick me up in Houston. I'll be there at 1 o'clock. And then at 1 o'clock, my phone would start ringing. Where are you? I'm circling the airport. Uh, my plane got delayed. Oh, no, no, no. Guys, the, the shit I did was just horrific. It was horrific. I'm surprised I fucking salvaged my career. Trust me, I'm telling you this. There was maybe three or four comedy clubs I fucked over that they're still waiting for me to show up or I had a delay. I, I, even Rogan tells a story. I was supposed to meet him at Rascals in Jersey and he kept calling me, where are you? And I'm like, I'm at the high airport in Vegas. I'm delayed. I was nowhere even in sight. I was nowhere, I was nowhere even in sight. And it's fucking sad to look back at it and to see where my life went. But guys, I could not keep it together. And I had just come off like the longest yard. People knew when I shot the movie. People knew already I was a fiend. And then I fucked over the Ontario Improv and they told everybody. So it was very fucking rough for Uncle Joey that first year. It was brutal. I, I, there were times when I was like, fuck it. I should just go back to snorting coke because I'm getting the same fucking reception, you know? You know, you quit. You have this problem. You fucking take all these years. You fucking look back. You quit. And all of a sudden now, people still a little rough to you. Like, they're still like... You know, the comedy store was kind of weird. At the time, I hadn't been at the comedy store no more. I quit Coke, and I just stayed away from the comedy store because I knew that there was no way. That was my fucking to go. That was, you know, if I went to the store, I stayed out of the store for six years, but I purposely stayed out of the store 
the first two years because I did not want to fucking be in that. You know, it was rough enough going out at night, having cash, having to drive home with the cash in your pocket at the store. You know, it was right there for me. The Coke was right there. All I had to do was walk to the front. So I voted the fucking Coke. But it, it took me, guys, you know, if, you, if you're thinking of quitting anything, don't think you're like, quitting is the easiest thing. Quitting is going to be the easiest fucking thing. You going, I'm throwing these pills away, or I'm throwing this blow away, or I'm throwing this weed away, or I'm never drinking. That's the easiest thing you got. It's the work you do afterward. That sucks dick. It sucks dick. I mean, nobody's going to lend you money, right? Like, nobody lends you money still. Because, yeah, you're sober, but now they're waiting for the big fucking blowout. So for a year, people are waiting for you to fall. I mean, guys, and you cannot be mad at somebody waiting for you to fall because for fucking 10 years, you've been lying to people. You've been lying to everybody, including your fucking self. So now you want people to say, oh, you quit. Sure, let's open up the fucking house and break out the wallets and the champagne bottle. No, people are going to be more cautious of you. You know, it's like when somebody wins a bunch of games in a row, you start betting against them. Because eventually they're gonna they're gonna fucking lose, they're gonna lose. Oh my god, I'm gonna bet again. And then they keep winning, they keep winning, they keep. And then when you don't bet, that's when they fucking lose. But it's just crazy how much of a fucking struggle I had. So when this guy hit me with this email, I was like, brother, listen, man. I sent them like a fucking twenty minute email, like about. <laughs> yeah, I wrote. You know, I usually try to keep it my email short so people don't send me long fucking emails. But this one, I had to put it down because I could see the concern. I still remember, like, my thinking, I still remember how much of a fucking struggle it was. And then people were hitting me up to give me coke. Because the craziest thing is, when you're doing coke, you can't find it. But now that you're not doing coke, it was everywhere. So every club I was going to now, people didn't know I was sober. So now they would come to the club and go, hey, we brought you an eight ball. And I'm like, oh, I'll hold on, hold on to it. When I, At the end of the show, I'll fucking come get it. And I would not even come out at the end of the show. It was a fucking nightmare how much cocaine was around me. When you don't want it, when you want it, it's not around. But when you don't want it, now it was fucking everywhere. And I was all right, like, I was done with it, guys. So I never had a problem. 15 years, I never had a problem. I never wanted a fucking urge to go back. I knew what would happen if I just did one line of fucking coke. I knew what would, like, I couldn't cheat with a bump. Every piece of work I did the last 15 years, like, if I, if I said to Mike, Mike, listen, let me just try a fucking line. If I just tried a line today... All the work I did the last 15 years would go fucking, the punishment would be unreal The fucking, because the promise I made was never to do it again. So the punishment I would get as a man would be unreal. So that was the easiest of my, but it would make you think, you know, when you're fucking a junkie, when you're a fucking savage like I was, half of my game was people coming up to me going, hey, can you get me an ounce of Coke? Sure, you know. I would take an eight ball out, put an eight ball of cut in. I made sure I got you the best Coke in town, but I threw some cut in it. That's how I made my fucking money, you know. If I was having a bad week, I would throw extra cut in it. If I was having a really bad week, I would just take your money and not give it to you. You know, that that's, I would disappear for a month. You'd be looking for me for a month. Where the fuck is he? I gave him $1,000. He told me he'd be back in 10 minutes. That was 10 weeks ago. But, when I stopped doing coke, guess what happened? All of a sudden, everybody wanted to buy coke from me. I still, I, I, Doug, I remember one time, like, I couldn't get nobody to give me, like, 250 Like, there was a couple comics that gave me money for eight balls, and I would go to El Compadre, buy the eight ball, do two lines, and not even give them the eight ball back. There's three big-name comics that gave me $250 for an eight ball at one time. And I just went and did it and never saw them like a month later. And they never even brought it up. Like they never even brought it up. And then there was people from time to time that would give you like, you know, 2000 bucks and go get me as much as you can. There was one comic that's a dear friend of mine that he caught me on a bad fucking week. And I just gave him like half cut. 
And he called me back. He's like, I can't give this to the people. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Do what you can. We didn't talk for about a year or two. Then he apologized. I apologized. I told him what I had done. And, you know, I gave him some pot or something. And we fucking made friends. But I, I, I still remember being, like, sober two months. And somebody called me up and, like, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah. Can we meet at, like, Starbucks? Sure. And they were like, dog, I got, like, fucking... 8,000 bucks or something. Something that I sat there and was like. <sighs> and I remember the guy going, what are you giggling about? I go, I'm just thinking about if you would have done this, gave me this the last two years I was snorting coke. You would have never saw me again. He goes, what do you mean? I go, I would have never gave you shit. $8,000, I would have gone to Vegas. <laughs> I would have gone to fucking Vegas and just did the $8,000 worth the fucking blow. I wouldn't have given you nothing. He's like, thank God you're not doing coke anymore. I go, thank God. It was it was just surreal, the test that the universe gives you. The universe starts testing you a little bit to see if you're really fucking, and that was the thing. Sober-wise, like, I had it covered. I was not not going to go back to cocaine, and that's the proof is in the pudding. I never slipped or anything. But the pressure is what drives you to fucking want to do a line. And to be honest with you guys, I never came clean about this, but I used to hit fucking meetings once in a while. Just off meetings, I would hit them, especially in the Valley. When I first moved to the Valley, there was a couple little meetings. A couple of them were AA, a couple of them were NA. It didn't fucking matter to me. With fucking junkies, what difference does it make? You're not going there being, oh, I'm not, I'm, I never drank before, who gives a fuck? Just listen to their stories. I would just go there and listen to their stories. I never fuck. I think I spoke one time in like eight meetings. I never, and I didn't go like every other day. I didn't really have a sponsor. I just had the schedule. There was one on. Uh, there was a little one, like a Russian one, by my by my house. I didn't want anybody to recognize me and shit. This is before podcasting and stuff. So I would just hit a fucking couple meetings. No stigma attached. Just to listen. And you would go in there and go, fuck, you know, wow, if this guy's putting up with that. Because when you go to those meetings, you hear people talking about worse shit than what you're going through. I had a place. I had a girlfriend. I had a job. I was doing stand-up. I had money coming in. You go to those fucking meetings, you hear stories about people that have nothing. Like they're living in a shelter and they come back. They lost everything. And that's a difference, that you need that. Not because you'll go, fuck. I'm better than they are, but because you go, you know what? I thought I was having a fucking bad day. This motherfucker is really having a fucking bad day. Now I feel a little better. So that was all those little things helped me. Comedy helped me. My friends helped me. Uh, but like I said, none of my friends were recovering fucking addicts. Like I couldn't talk to Joe Rogan about it or Ari or, or Duncan. They just were like, you know, okay, we'll watch you. We'll watch you from time to time and... But again, that was the, the wanting to do the drug was the easy thing. I didn't want to do the drug. I just wanted to get over what was going on around me. I just wanted this stigma that I don't know if they. It's like when you get out of prison. When you get out of prison, you go to shop and shop right. All of a sudden, you're like this fucking guy knows I just got out of prison. I could tell by the way he's looking at me. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like you just feel that everybody is looking at you. You're like why is everybody fucking looking at me? You know, and that's what happens when you get off the fucking drugs. You're like, these people know I robbed this. These people know I did coke. These, people, You know, and they don't know anything. It's you that's walking in there on edge because one of the fucking most truest stories I heard, when I was on the longest yard, there was a wardrobe woman who was fucking a hippie, and she was tremendous. I, I really enjoyed her company. Every day she would come in, and every day I'd go, come on, dog, when are we going to get stoned? And she'd go, ooh. I'm not, I haven't gotten high in 11 years. I went to Woodstock. She was one of those chicks that went to Woodstock. She seen Jimi Hendrix, the whole fucking deal. And she would always say to me, and I was doing blow then. She, I don't know if she knew or she didn't, but she would always say to me, you know what's weird? When you stop smoking pot and see the world. And I would look at her like, why would I want to do that? You know, when you stop smoking pot... 
and you see the world and you see the things you miss. And I would think about like, what the fuck she talking about? Well, guess what? That happens when you give up alcohol. That happens when you give up pills. That happens when you give up coke. When I gave up coke, I heard sounds I never heard before. You know, like you just hear, it's like when I put my hearing aids on at night. You know, and I go pee. I go, fuck, I never heard my pee hit the water like this. <laughs> it hits it hard. You know what I'm saying? Like, seriously. When I put my fucking hearing aids on at night, I hear shit that, you know, I don't put my hearing aids on at daytime. I don't need them. I need them at night because the sound of the television bounces, so I have to control it, you know. When I go to a restaurant, I have a hard time at those places. But when I fucking, uh, you know, when I put my fucking hearing aids on, it's, it's, like a whole new world. it's like a whole new fucking world. But that's the thing that sounds the best. When I take my dick out and I pee, holy shit. When the pee hits the water, I'm like, what the hell? My fuck, my ears can't take it. That's a, that's a, that's how fucking, that's how deaf I am. So it's just really weird. That's what happens when you see, like seeing the world without those fucking things. Like for me, it was 29 fucking years. You know, you don't see nothing, you don't see Martians, but I'm sure that you're fucking, it affects your brain thought. I know for a fact. I know for a fact. I found the video a couple of years ago, two years ago when I moved here, some jerk off put it up of us talking in his yard, and I was on coke then. I could not even understand me. I was having like eight conversations at once with ten different fucking people, and it's, it's, it was not good. So when you start hearing these things again and you start seeing things you haven't seen in years, you're like, what the fuck is that? You just haven't seen that shit. You've had, you know, you've been high for fucking 30 years. What the fuck did you see? It's so funny. When you read uh, Henry Hill's daughter's book, she has a great book. I don't even think you can find it anymore. She wrote a book right after Goodfellas saying that he was a liar. And she didn't say he was a liar. She just goes, listen, man, let's be honest. When you're doing that amount of drugs, how much of a memory do you really have? For him to remember all that stuff. She goes, I remember waking him up and he didn't even know if he had to go to fucking work the next day. He didn't know my wife's name. He didn't know my, my brother's name. He didn't know my sister's name. So, and that I even, I, I, I take that into consideration with me also. I was so high half the fucking time. I don't remember a lot of shit, but I remember a lot of shit because I have a memory of a fucking of a fucking elephant. You understand me? I remember fucking everything. You know, I look at my daughter now. I asked my daughter a question about something the other day. Dog, she repeated it back to me like she was there at the moment. It was so vivid and so clear. And I remember being a kid and my mother saying to me, holy shit. You got a great fucking memory. Like, you you just described something to the T. You know, I asked her about it. I talked to a friend of mine on the phone, a villa, and she goes, like, did I tell you I met your daughter? I met her at a party, and I told her you grew up in my house and stuff. I saw her the other day. I go, dog, you never told me you met a villa. And she goes, <laughs> she's like, and she's like, a villa? I didn't meet no fucking a villa. I go, yes, you did. You met him at uh, Lisa's fucking birthday party. She goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Little guy built, no hair. She described him to the fucking T. North Bergen shirt on, the whole fucking deal, you know, blonde girlfriend. I was like, you know, that's the memory I fucking had. This happened a month ago. But that's the memory I fucking had as a kid. My memory is not that fucking bad, but. It doesn't really matter. We're not talking about memories here. <laughs> We're talking about how the memory got erased, okay? We're talking about the, how the fucking memory got erased. <laughs> it's always a fun fucking Monday morning podcast. I love the Monday morning podcast because we get to fucking talk about something that... I just love it that we could talk about something that's gonna you're gonna build on and I'm gonna build on and we'll, you know just me, me remembering what I went through that that year, that first year of sobriety. It was brutal. It was fucking brutal. I remember getting better on stage though. I remember noticing after six months of not doing powder. I remember noticing shit like the number one thing I stopped sweating on stage. Holy shit, when I was doing coke, and I'm, I wouldn't do coke before I went on stage. I'm talking about doing coke the night before. 
<laughs> getting on stage the day after and fucking puddles would be coming out of my fucking body. I don't know how that cocaine affected my sweat the next day on stage, but that was one thing I noticed immediately. But that's just uh, vanity shit. You know, it's just smelly shit. I'm talking about my timing was better. I always, one of my biggest problems always in comedy was me and Mike would discuss a joke all week. And we would discuss it for five fucking minutes before I went on stage. And I come off stage and he go, you didn't do the joke. Motherfucker. Uh, motherfucker. And I would kill. Like I would destroy that room, but I would be furious. Because I've always forgot that one fucking joke. That was my M.O. All the fucking time when I got off stage, Ari and Duncan, you didn't do the joke, you didn't do the joke, you didn't do the joke. Fuck. That was my thing. Once I stopped doing coke, dog, I went up there and I remembered jokes I never even wrote yet. You understand me? I remember <laughs> jokes that Jesus told at the Last Supper. That's how good my fucking uh, everything was cooking on gas. So if you're thinking of getting off whatever the fuck you're on for 2023, just remember, Rome wasn't built overnight, guys. The hardest thing is not going to be you getting off it. You know, they're gonna you're going to have your night sweats, and you're going to want to jump out a window for fucking the first week. But after that, you're like, what the fuck was all the fuss about? I didn't die, and I could do this standing on my fucking head. And then it's just you getting back into the... Into the routine, getting a routine to get you away from those freaky fucking people that you were doing drugs with. Not that they're bad people. Not that they're bad people. Just for a little time, you just need a little breather until you can handle yourself under them. And, you know, if you need it, man, I tell you, I, I don't want you to think I'm Captain AA, but fucking it works, guys. It works. And A, that shit works. You know, if you just want to maintain... You don't want to say, that's the best thing about those things. You could just go there, sit, scratch your balls and listen. Drink the fucking terrible coffee, put a dollar in the basket and go home. You'll get strong. And that, dog, I didn't do it every week. But from time to time, whenever I was having a shitty week or a shitty day, I would pop in a meeting. What the fuck? Who gives a fuck? And if they got a fat man meeting, go to that one. Whatever the fuck. Uh, you know, if they got the one Al-Anon where you're married to somebody who's an Alki, go to that one. I don't give a fuck. I did all that shit, guys, and it helped me. And yeah, you're going to have your fucking periods when you get off the shit. You're going to see the real world for the first time in a long time, you know. I remember a couple of weeks ago, I was going to Philly and I was getting dressed and I Went to put pants on and shit, and all of a sudden, I'm like, I wasn't feeling good. And I'm like, wow, this is where I would take a Xanax. This is where I would take a Xanax right now because of how I'm feeling. And it would just fucking take away the feeling right away. Now I'm not taking a Xanax, and I'm learning to live with these feelings. It was the same thing I had to do with Coke. Same, same thing I have to do with Coke. It's a lifestyle change. It's not a fucking diet, cocksuckers. And that's the morning Monday morning podcast. I don't know what else to tell you, cocksuckers. I got a lot of great uh, reviews from you guys on Stoner's Club. They're really helping you guys out. They finally got the laughing gas in stock. I think they got some sashimi. It's the new sashimi that's stronger than fucking debt. So if you want some uh, laughing gas, hit them up. I don't know if it's the New York market or the New Jersey market. Remember, Uncle Joey, one word. 10% off for life, bitches. Who's better than you? And for you motherfuckers that are asking about laughing gas, the sweatshirts, t-shirts, the merch, just go to laughinggas.com. Use co. .co. Use Coco and get 10% off your first fucking order. It's that simple. It's a beautiful Monday morning. We got a couple fucking weeks till Christmas. This is the best fucking holiday I'm having so far. I have nothing on my mind. I don't have to do any comedy till after the holidays. And all this is about is just getting high, having a great time with the fucking girls, my friends, Mike, Lee, when he comes down on the 26th. And this is what it is, guys. So it's a whole different world, and it's going to change for 2023. I love you motherfuckers. Have a great day. Stay black. And now for a word from my motherfucking sponsors, Jack. 
All right. I want to thank you guys. It's a short one today. I'm a no fucking. I got things to do and people to see, but you got the message. Listen, tis the season for clean balls. Manscaped is the one-stop shop for all your holiday needs. Dad has those nasty nose hairs. Save his life with the weed whacker nose and ear and hair trimmer. He'll fucking love it. And Grandpa's going to love the lawnmower 4.0. The electric razor advanced skin safe technology is a life changer that reduces nicks and cuts on the fucking sack of love. You understand me? Manscaped is here to make the holiday shopping a blast. Everybody needs fucking Manscaped. Your disgusting uncle, your grandpa with the nose, with the hairs coming out of his fucking nose and the three-inch eyebrows. Get 20% off and free shipping with code Joey at manscaped.com. Again, that's 20% off and free shipping with code Joey at manscaped.com. Manscaped. The big, the perfect gift for the holiday season. The joint is also brought to you by Blue Chew. Listen, you ever want to sling dick over the holidays, but you had too much fucking eggnog? Blue Chew's here to ser- change that around. What's Blue Chew, Joey? Blue Chew's an online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis only in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime. And be ready whenever the opportunity arises or whenever you bump into a freak. The process is simple. You sign up at BlueChew.com. You consult one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. The best part is it's all done online. You don't need to see nobody. BlueChew tablets are made in the U.S. of A. And shipped in a discreet package. If you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. Try Blue Chew for free when using promo code Joey. Just pay $5 for shipping. That's bluechew.com, code Joey for the first month free. I want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the joint. I want to thank Blue Chew. I want to thank Manscaped. And I want to thank you fucking savages for having my back on a Monday morning. I'll see you cocksuckers Thursday morning. Tip, top, magoo. Stay black.